I'm Jacob McDonough, founder and portfolio manager of McDonough Investments. I manage a concentrated portfolio of stocks for clients in a separately managed account structure. In this episode of the 10K Podcast, I'm going to go through the 1975 annual report for GEICO. In the previous episode, I gave some background on the company and went through its 1974 report. Maybe a good place to start is what I see on the first page when I flip open my copy of the 1975 annual report that I received from the Harvard Library. It says, Addendum to the 1975 annual report to shareholders of the Government Employees Insurance Company. Since the printing of the annual report, the company has received an order from the Director of Insurance of Arizona suspending the company's certificate of authority in that state. Thus, while the company cannot write any new business in Arizona, it can continue to service and renew its existing business. March 10, 1976 That's not exactly what you want to see if you're Geico. The company would not be allowed to find new customers in Arizona, and that state was not alone in its decision. This was the result of the hole Geico dug itself in. The company was burning through cash, and regulators would demand to see more capital on hand at Geico to help pay for potential losses on policies. AM Best, which is an insurance industry rating service and data provider, withdrew its rating on Geico during the year. Early in the 1974 annual report, management wrote that it was the most difficult year in the history of the property and casualty insurance industry. Unfortunately, management had to write the same statement again in 1975. This time they wrote that this past year was by far the most difficult one ever experienced by property and casualty insurance companies. Last year was the most difficult at that time, and then this year was by far the most difficult. In the last episode, I brought up a quote from Buffett that was written in the book The Snowball. Buffett said he looked at Geico in 1975 and noted that it was very clear the company was under-reserved for the claims they would have on their policies. He went in person to see the CEO, but Buffett was ignored. I also talked about how he wrote two separate times in his 1974 letter to shareholders that many of Berkshire's insurance competitors had inadequate loss reserves. I don't know the exact calculation Buffett used or what he looked at. My guess is that he looked at the loss development that Geico would have reported to insurance regulators or agencies. But Geico was clear in the 1974 annual report that costs were rising at a double-digit percentage pace due to inflation, and yet it disclosed that the average premium per automobile policy in force increased just 3.9% in 1972, 0.8% in 1973, and 0.5% in 1974. Costs were rising fast while the prices that Geico was charging were not. This is a problem. Margins typically aren't very big to begin with in the insurance industry, so even just a year or two of costs outpacing the rates you charge can really damage an insurance company. No surprise here, but Buffett turned out to be correct. Geico was under-reserved. In January of 1976, Geico's board approved management's recommendation to provide an additional $35 million to settle claims from prior periods. This $35 million was part of Geico's underwriting loss for 1975. When you look at the income statement for an insurance company, a portion of the expenses are for estimates for future losses. If it'll take two years from the time of the sale to settle a claim, you don't get to have 100% gross margins in year one and then take all of the expense in year two. Companies expect to have some amount of insurance claims on their policies and give their best estimate of that future cost. Here's what Geico wrote about the loss reserves in their 1975 annual report. Loss reserves are estimates of the eventual cost of claims incurred but not finally settled. These reserve estimates are based not only on historical experience but also of necessity include a judgment of the effect on such claim costs of future economic and social forces. A reconciliation of past reserve estimates with actual loss cost developments is monitored continuously, and such revisions of the reserves, as are indicated, are made periodically. In the past two years, escalating inflation of double-digit magnitude on the cost for medical care, auto crash parts, and home repairs combined to make loss reserve estimates of future claim costs extremely vulnerable to variations from assumed limits of accuracy. In addition to economic inflation, social inflation of jury awards, and recent structural changes in the tort liability system 
introduced by No Fault Automobile Insurance, made an accurate assessment of future events and loss of reserve estimates even more difficult. Since GEICO was underreserved, their income in prior periods was overstated. This means you pay more in taxes than you should, but that is the least of their worries here. The main problem is that you don't fully understand the cost of your product. Imagine if Ford sold a car for $50,000 for a few years, and then two years later realized it cost them really $75,000 to make each car. That would be a major problem. Every business needs to understand their costs. But a difficult aspect of the insurance industry is that there is a greater than usual time lag in between the sale and when costs are realized. Making cost accounting more of a guess. To be a quality insurance company, you need to be very skilled at estimating your costs, and you need a margin of safety as well to account for the unexpected. This next part bothers me, but let me read the excerpt from the annual report first. In July 1975, management informed the board of directors of its intention to retain a consulting actuarial firm to assist in the review and analysis of GEICO's reserve for losses and loss expenses. A large and well-known consulting actuarial firm was retained in September 1975, and an interim report was received from them in late December. They go on to say that, subsequently, on February 23, 1976, shareholders were advised that management and its actuaries were continuing their review of loss reserves. It was announced that the loss reserves might require further strengthening that other financial adjustments might be required, and that for this reason management had requested a suspension of trading in the company's securities. Let's talk about why this bothers me. Warren Buffett visited your office and told you that your reserves for insurance losses are a problem. He took time out of his schedule and charged you nothing to tell you that your reserves are a problem. This should be all the inspiration you need to go and make a change immediately. What does Geico do here? In July, they announced the intention of retaining a consulting actuarial firm. They are sure to mention that it's large and well-known. I'm sure that this large and well-known firm is going to charge more than Buffett's free advice while still delivering less value. You shouldn't need actuarial consultants if you are Geico, as you need to be the absolute expert in your field. You can't outsource this role of being an actuary. Not to mention that they are moving far too slow. In July 1975, they say they have the intention to hire an outside firm. In September, they finally hire that firm. In late December 1975, that firm finally gave them an interim report. In late February of 1976, they still say they are continuing their review and might need to strengthen their reserves further. As Chris Berman used to say on ESPN when going over the highlights for the NFL, tick, 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 tick. That clock is running. Time is running out. To me, this is a sign of a slow, bureaucratic organization. Geico didn't always used to be this way prior to the 1970s. High inflation is bad for everyone. There are no winners. There are some businesses that have attributes that make them less damaged by high inflation than others, but no one benefits overall. You need a healthy fear of inflation. You need to respect it as your opponent or enemy. Buffett definitely has a healthy fear of inflation and seems to have a sense of urgency around this topic and on how insurance companies need to respond by charging higher prices. Geico seemed caught off guard by this inflationary period. This situation highlights the difficulty of the insurance business. One bad period can ruin you if you take your eye off the ball. You can have high-quality underwriting for decades. Then, in a short period of time, inflation can raise your expenses to a dangerous level if you aren't quickly responding with price increases. 1975 was a tough year for the insurance industry, but the year was catastrophic for GEICO. The property and casualty industry had an underwriting loss of $4.1 billion overall, with $2 billion of that coming from auto insurance. I mentioned in the previous podcast that GEICO had an underwriting loss of $5.9 million in 1974, its first underwriting loss in 29 years. In 1975, the firm reported a pre-tax underwriting loss of $190.9 million. This loss exceeded the equity capital GEICO had at the start of the year. GEICO did have $33.6 million of investment income, though, leading to a net operating loss of $124.2 million after tax. Since the underwriting loss was so bad, GEICO had to write down all of its remaining deferred policy acquisition costs, an intangible asset on the balance sheet. 
This write-down took place in the fourth quarter of 1975 and amounted to $45.7 million. This was a non-cash expense and really was just an accounting entry. This allows an insurance company to spread out the cost of acquiring a customer over the life of the insurance contract. This includes expenses like commissions paid to brokers. The idea here is that it helps match revenues with expenses. U.S. companies use gap accounting, while insurance companies also report statutory accounting figures. Statutory accounting excludes deferred acquisition costs when calculating both profit and capital. This means that the loss on, on a statutory basis was a bit lower in 1975 compared to the gap accounting loss, but also that the statutory capital was less in past years than under gap accounting. I just bring this up to give some context of what went into the $190.9 million pre-tax underwriting loss GEICO sustained in 1975. The figure included the write-down of deferred policy acquisition costs, as well as the $35 million expense to settle claims from prior periods. GEICO had a combined ratio of 124.2% in 1975, with a loss ratio of 109.8%, and an expense ratio of 14.4%. This ratio is pretty unbelievable on both sides of the combined ratio. GEICO's insurance policies were extremely unprofitable even before taking into account any overhead expenses. On the other hand, the expense ratio is extremely low, which means its overhead costs are far lower than the vast majority of competitors could achieve. To me, that just makes their loss ratio look even worse. A typical insurance company might have an expense ratio that was twice as high as GEICO's. If that was the case here, GEICO's combined ratio would have been 138.6%. You just can't stay in the insurance business with an underwriting like that. The annual report says, Involuntary auto insurance business has been a significant factor in contributing to our underwriting loss. While involuntary risks represented only 7.2% of our 1975 automobile insurance earned premium volume. They produced a statutory underwriting loss of $29.9 million, or 19.9% of our losses in the automobile line. In the last episode, I discussed how Geico's involuntary insurance business was a problem. It was highly unprofitable. In 1975, involuntary risks accounted for just 7.2% of total auto premium volume, and yet produced an underwriting loss of $29.9 million. Management mentions that the annualized rate increases for the involuntary business should total $11.3 million, but that they will only partially offset the continuing underwriting losses which are expected for these risks in 1976. Basically, management is saying the involuntary insurance business will continue to be highly unprofitable. As long as Geico wants to remain in the auto insurance industry, they have no choice but to put up with the involuntary business. Their voluntary business will have to produce enough profits to make up for the involuntary losses. So Geico had underwriting losses of $190.9 million. Within this loss, we have a $45.7 million write-down of deferred policy acquisition costs, a $35 million expense to settle claims from prior periods to help make up for the fact that they are under-reserved, and losses from involuntary insurance policies totaling $29.9 million. These three items account for $110.6 million worth of the underwriting loss. Unfortunately, that still leaves a massive $80.3 million of underwriting loss to account for. I mentioned that the voluntary business for GEICO has a responsibility to not just produce profits, but to make up for the involuntary losses. Obviously, even the voluntary business was highly unprofitable in 1975. This was concerning. In the previous episode, I talked about how GEICO had high leverage due to its premiums written being 5.44 times higher than its statutory surplus. In 1975, this ratio skyrocketed to 13.4 times. This was due to the fact that underwriting losses wiped out a big chunk of GEICO's equity capital. It's not like GEICO was trying to get more leverage here. This ratio being at over 13 times just shows how GEICO's capital was deteriorating. Insurance regulators won't allow you to operate a company with leverage this high, so GEICO would have to fix the situation somehow. GEICO just couldn't stop pushing for growth during this period. Its policies in force grew 8.7% in 1975 to 2.8 million policies. It finally was able to raise the rates it charged on insurance policies in 1975, but higher rates didn't really kick in right away 
at the beginning of 1975. Premiums written increased by 18% in 1975, partially from an 8.7% growth in policies in force, and the remainder from price increases. Geico talks about the annualized rate increases in the following quote. As of year-end 1975, the annualized premium value of those rate increases for voluntary auto business, based on 1975 volume, totaled $111.2 million, an increase in the average rate level of 21%. The company uses the phrase annualized value of rate increases and also says based on 1975 volume. I assume they raised prices later in the year and extrapolated that out across all of their policies and assumed no customers would leave. There might not be anything wrong with this, as Geico was losing so much money that I doubt its drivers would be able to find a better price elsewhere. Maybe they could retain all of their customers even with a 21% increase in price. I just found that phrasing to be interesting. You never count your money when you're sitting at the table. So potential investors in Geico in 1975 just should be wary of expecting all of that $111.2 million to flow into Geico. Obviously, revenue, which in this case would be premiums written, did not increase by 21%, even with an 8.7% increase in policies. Also, the $111.2 million of potential premiums from higher prices still looks pretty small compared to GEICO's $190.9 million pre-tax underwriting loss. The company stopped paying a dividend to shareholders after the first quarter of 1975. It surprises me that GEICO waited this long to cut its dividend after a very difficult fourth quarter of 1974 in 1975 not getting off to a good start. This is more evidence of Geico's management team being in denial, dragging its feet, and not facing the reality of the extent of the difficulties the company was facing. The company paid out $14.2 million of dividends in 1974 and then paid out $3.5 million worth in the first quarter of 1975. It just didn't have enough capital on hand after the devastating losses of 1975. In the annual report, it states that the Superintendent of Insurance of the District of Columbia has ordered this deficiency to be remedied by April 30th, 1976. The deficiency being the lack of capital at GEICO. This is the annual report for 1975, so that year is already over. April 30th, 1976 can't be that far away. And by the way, it's the Superintendent of Insurance for the District of Columbia because that's the area uh, GEICO's headquartered. That's where it's based. Now, I've spent quite a bit of time hammering home the fact that there were issues at Geico. Reading this annual report, my view is that there was a decent probability that Geico would go out of business, or at least that equity holders would be wiped out before Geico emerges from some sort of bankruptcy or restructuring. So these are the issues facing the company. What were the next steps? In the annual report, it says that the board has retained two investment banking firms to act as financial advisors with regard to the company's capital financing program and merger possibilities. It says that the capital financing program could include the issuance of additional common stock and or preferred stock. It is interesting to look back and think about the alternative ending to this story. The report just said that they were looking at merger possibilities. Geico could have been acquired or could have merged with someone in this period. Maybe Berkshire could have come up with the capital to get the deal done for all the company. That would have saved them billions of dollars down the road. In reality, though, Berkshire was not big enough in terms of its capital to completely acquire Geico and Geico's liabilities at this time. But maybe they could have found some sort of creative financing or reinsurance transaction to lay off some of the risk from liabilities onto others. So Geico is focused on raising capital. Next, the firm is going to raise rates substantially. Geico already disclosed that it raised rates by 21% at some point in 1975. In the annual report, it says that Rate increases of an overall magnitude at least as great as were obtained in 1975 will be actively sought in 1976. So after not really raising rates at all in 1973 or 74, Geico raised rates 21% sometime in 1975, and they plan to do at least another 21% in 1976. This will be an important step to achieve. Next, management plans to gradually reduce the number of voluntary automobile insurance policies in force during 1976 until underwriting profitability is again restored. I don't like the word gradually in this context. Geico needs a sense of urgency, but they definitely do need to reduce their business and focus on profitability. The company reduced its workforce by 8.6% during the year, 
with the headcount numbering 7,760 employees at the end of 1975. This cost control, the reduction of policies in force, and a focus on profitability all should have been started the minute Warren Buffett walked into their office and warned the CEO what was happening. Not gradually at this point in time at the end of 1975. Really, they should have done it before Warren Buffett got there, but still, at least at that point in time. Geico increased liquidity through the sale and leaseback of some of its real estate. The company also sold some stocks. After a large stock market decline, 1975 does not seem like the best time to sell stocks, at least with the benefit of hindsight. That is the trouble with being a forced seller. If you think about Berkshire, they were always positioned well in terms of liquidity and conservatism to take advantage of buying when there were forced sellers like this. It takes discipline to achieve this though, and it takes looking silly and missing out on opportunities during bull markets sometimes. The best companies get stronger during the tough times. Rockefeller and Standard Oil come to mind as an example of this, and Berkshire took advantage of many market declines as well. J.P. Morgan was able to acquire Washington Mutual and Bear Stearns during the financial crisis and recently scooped up First Republic during a period of panic. I'm not sure their acquisitions during the financial crisis turned out as well as they'd hoped, but the point is that they were able to not only survive, but be aggressive and stay on the offensive during a time of tough market conditions. We can't say the same for Geico during this period. Geico ended 1975 with equity capital of just $36.9 million. The company had $669 million of premiums written during the year, and you just can't operate this kind of business with just $36.9 million of equity capital. They still had $885.6 million of assets, including almost $400 million of bonds. The problem is that Geico's liabilities were almost as high as that asset figure. Remember, liabilities are difficult to estimate at an insurance company, so you want to have a large margin of safety between these two figures. Last episode, I compared Geico during 1974 with Buffett and Berkshire. I want to continue that comparison for 1975. In Buffett's 1975 letter, he opens with the following. Last year, when discussing the prospects for 1975, we stated, The outlook for 1975 is not encouraging. This forecast proved to be distressingly accurate. He goes on to say that. On balance, however, current trends indicate a somewhat brighter 1976. That is nice to hear from Mr. Buffett. There's a light at the end of the tunnel. Despite the tough year, Berkshire still earned $6.7 million in 1975. Although profitable, the company earned a low return on equity, registering at just 7.6%. Buffett goes on to write about his estimation for the future, and he said that, and at least a moderate improvement in insurance underwriting results will more than offset other possible negatives to produce greater earnings in 1976. The major variable, and by far the most difficult to predict with any feeling of confidence, is the insurance underwriting result. Present very tentative indications are that underwriting improvement is in prospect. If such improvement is moderate, our overall gain in earnings in 1976 likewise will prove moderate. More significant underwriting improvement could give us a major gain in earnings. Later in the letter, Buffett writes that, the property and casualty insurance industry had its worst year in history during 1975. We did our share, unfortunately even somewhat more. Really disastrous results were concentrated in auto and long tail, contracts where settlement of loss usually occurs long after the loss event lines. In the last podcast, I praised Buffett's tone in his letters and criticized the tone of Geico's management. To be clear, Berkshire's insurance operations still struggled in a major way during this period. When I did my research for the book I wrote on the financials of the early years of Berkshire, one thing that really stood out to me was that Berkshire had plenty of struggles in the insurance business. I really tried to convey that message to readers. The book is called Capital Allocation, The Financials of a New England Textile Mill, 1955 to 1985. Go check out the book. In terms of this time period though, Berkshire's total insurance segment had a combined ratio of 109.8% in 1974 and 115.4% in 1975. These results are rough. Geico did better than Berkshire in 1974 with a combined ratio of 101.2. Geico fared worse in 1975 with a combined ratio of 124.2. Berkshire overall was still profitable during this entire period though and was able to go on the offensive instead of being forced to struggle to survive. 
Why was this? Why did Berkshire escape this period unharmed and ready to take advantage of opportunities while Geico was on the verge of bankruptcy? Importantly, Berkshire had a better reaction to the difficulties during this period. In terms of Berkshire's reaction, the company raised prices and reduced the size of its business during the early 1970s. I didn't notice any disclosure of the policies in force at Berkshire in the 1975-10K that I have, but premiums written declined 11.3% at Berkshire from 1971 to 1975. As I've mentioned, Geico experienced high growth during this period. In Buffett's 1975 letter to shareholders, Buffett wrote that rates were increased frequently and significantly. If Berkshire charged higher prices on its policies and revenue still declined, then this means that its policies and force must have shrunk. This tells me that Berkshire reduced its business significantly in this period. If Geico would have followed suit, then it would have been in much better shape. Premiums written did increase substantially in 1976 and 1977 at Berkshire, though, in the period that follows this year, as the company was able to take advantage of the downturn in the industry. This also comes back to the structure of Berkshire and its leverage. Berkshire had diversified earning streams coming in from businesses outside of insurance, while Geico was almost exclusively in the auto insurance business. As I mentioned in the last episode, Berkshire had far less leverage as well, since its insurance revenue was less than its equity capital. Geico, on the other hand, was levered four to five times in terms of its premiums written to its equity capital. You can run an insurance company a few different ways. On one end of the spectrum, you could take operational risks while taking on little investment risk. Under this structure, your premiums written compared to equity capital might be higher than average, while your assets are skewed towards a safe fixed income portfolio. This is how I think about the progressive corporation today, an important competitor to Geico. For this setup to work, you need excellent underwriting ability and you need it consistently. Progressive has had this high quality underwriting during its history. On the other end of the spectrum, you could take less operational risk while taking on more investment risk. This is Berkshire style. Under this structure, your premiums written compared to equity capital might be lower than average while your assets are skewed toward equity securities. I am much more in favor of the Berkshire method. Even if the equity securities just perform on pace with the market average, results can be very good if underwriting is profitable. Then you have far less to worry about if underwriting unexpectedly turns unprofitable for a short period of time. You have a much better chance of surviving difficult underwriting periods. This leads me to what interests me most about the insurance industry. An insurance company doesn't really need capital to function, it just needs capital to fall back on during tough times. This has a few important implications. Every business strives to earn high returns on capital, or else why would people risk investing their hard-earned money in that business venture? If investors could consistently get better returns on safe government bonds, then they would be irrational to put that money to work in a low-returning business that has operational risks. So the equity capital you put into a business needs to earn you adequate returns. The equity capital of an insurance company could be put to work in stocks. A moderately successful investor could earn an adequate return on this portfolio of stocks alone, meaning the goal of earning an adequate return on your equity capital would already be achieved for an insurance company like this. Any underwriting profit or any investment income from a fixed income portfolio that the policyholders' funds or liabilities are invested into would be a cherry on top. This means a portfolio manager can leverage his or her equity portfolio into additional income streams at insurance companies. This idea could be extended to non-financial businesses that don't require physical capital to operate. One example would be an engineering or construction contractor that has high deferred revenue. It might not require capital to function, but needs capital to fall back on in case there are cost overruns on the project they are working on. I got a little off tangent there. But I wanted to close this podcast episode by going back to the 1975 annual report for Geico and read how management closes this letter. They write, In spite of the disastrous year through which we have passed, Geico's efficient organization, which services policyholders and claimants throughout the country, remains intact. The plans of management to regain underwriting profitability are sound and we believe will be successful. Premium rate increases heretofore granted and to be obtained in 1976 will continue to have a beneficial effect on our earned premiums during the year, and the proper balance between premium rates and losses should be gradually restored. 
We enter the year 1976 determined to meet the challenging problems that face us and confident that we can cope with them. That was from the President Ralph Peck and Chairman Norm Gidden. In the next year, we will see a new management team take over. In walks Jack Byrne, and things change in a hurry. Thanks for listening, and next time I look forward to bringing you the 1976 annual report for GEICO. I'd love to hear any questions or comments from listeners. You can reach me at jacob at mcdonough-investments.com or on Twitter at mcd underscore investments. Thanks again.